Hello, horror files. You're listening to Dissecting Horror, examining the anatomy of fear in film, television, and literature. I'm writer and performer Kelsey Zukowski. I'm filmmaker Stephen Aguilera. In this episode, we'll examine the 1963 film The Haunting, based on the novel The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, covered in our previous podcast. This dissection will contain minor spoilers, though these subjects aren't especially prone to spoilage. We are the Horror Whisperers, your champions of horror and keepers of the fearscape, on this podcast of frights and delights, if you will. I will. And we hope you will join us too, won't you? Dr. Markway leads a small group of ghost hunters to a supposedly haunted mansion to conduct experiments to prove the existence of the paranormal. The group consists of Eleanor Lance, a psychologically tortured woman, Theodora, a lesbian clairvoyant who befriends Eleanor, and a hip young cynic, Luke Sanderson, whose family owns the house. The paranormal activity that ensues affects the group differently, leading each to explore his or her own insecurities and leaving viewers wondering whether the real terrors are not contained in the house, but exist within the psyches of the characters. That according to the Encyclopedia Britannica of all things. This 1963 adaption of the Shirley Jackson novel The Haunting of Hill House was released just four years after the book's publication. After seeing the film, Jackson told a reporter it terrified her. She, quote, couldn't believe that she had written this, unquote. Off record, she wasn't thrilled with some plot changes, but she loved the deadly Hill House itself. This film was directed by the versatile Robert Wise, famed for helming such classics as West Side Story, The Sound of Music, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and 1979's Star Trek The Motion Picture. Did you see any of those? West Side Story? <laughs> The new one doesn't count. No, I've seen the original. I've seen neither. So, um, yeah, I, I saw uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture many times. Okay, nice. But none of the others. I don't think any of the... Well, no, I did see The Day the Earth Stood Still, but I'm not into musicals. I love musicals of any I like, so, like Grease. Although The West Side Story isn't my favorite. I don't even know what it's about. I assume it's like uh, in New York uh, struggling. Yeah, it's like a little struggle, a little gangs, a little love story. It's sort of... Romeo and Juliet in a New York gangster setting, ah. you know, sort of star-crossed lovers from different different uh, sides and tragedy and bad communication that end in disarray and tragedy. Classic. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's not bad for what it is. I think I've just seen too many versions of it now. So, yeah, even when I could appreciate things about uh, the newest one, but... I'm just like, oh, I've just seen this story too many times before. Yeah, that's how I feel just looking at it. It feels like I have a, an aversion to stage plays, much mm -hmm. less stage musicals. I don't know what it is. I, I respect actors who have that kind of training, and I, yeah. I definitely feel like they're someone that I want to work with who's dedicated and who has honed their craft having gone through that. But um, sitting through a stage play is, to me is – just fucking kill me. I hate them so much. Oh, I, wow. <laughs> I absolutely cannot stand the thought. It's For me, it, that and weddings are the two things that I just cannot deal with. I'd, I'd much rather go to a funeral or something. But Like oh every God. genre? Doesn't matter it if it's like something matter. that would be super up your alley, like it, a no, sci-fi epic stage play? <laughs> it would help if it were something along those lines. Yeah. But generally speaking, there's a certain tension that I feel in a live performance that I don't like. It's a sensation mm. that something could go wrong in a given moment. And also there's a, a sense that it's not going to last forever. Like mm -hmm. a, on a film, if you're going to go through all this trouble, you might as well preserve it so people can watch it forever. And a stage play, it's just so fleeting. I feel like, why would you go through all that work for something that it's just going to be gone after the night's over? But maybe that's something that's part of the appeal to others. I've, I've had this conversation many mm -hmm. times, but... Yeah. So The Haunting, um, upon the opening, it just immediately brings you into this haunting history of Hill House and its allure with eerie foreboding atmosphere and just this compelling mystery. I felt like the film handled the source material pretty faithfully, only with a few things slightly altered or left out, mostly being pretty minor and not really changing or diminishing the core of the story, which is this supernatural versus psychological character study meets doomed love story if you were to view the house as this morbid uh, praying lover. I was actually surprised after having read the book how much of the book was still in the movie. Normally they have mm -hmm. to really slash and burn, but what they did change 
really made it better, if anything. And it wasn't just some slapped on fix like a Band-Aid. It was, it really worked quite well. And after having read the book, I, I picked up things watching the movie that I didn't notice in the movie before. But having read the book, I thought, oh, okay, I can mm. see why they, they peppered that in. It made more sense. But what was the guy's name? The um, Gidding, uh, something Gidding. I don't think I wrote it down. But he's on the um, the commentary track. And he sounds like the oldest motherfucker you've ever heard in your <laughs> life. I mean, he, he has one of those voices that sounds like he was smoking cigars since he was 12 mm -hmm. or something and old school Hollywood types and very unpleasant to hear the sound of you know that much phlegm in somebody's mouth when they're trying to utter every other <laughs> guy's like 110 or something but did you listen to the commentary track by chance I did not it's what's the word it's commentated by the writer the director mm -hmm. and the four main stars 40 okay. years after the film was made oh, so wow. You don't really see that. The fact that they were all alive, this was something like in 2003, I think, mm -hmm. when they recorded it. But it, you got some direct insights of people who spoke to um, Shirley Jackson and collaborated with her, asked her questions about her story when developing the film. So, wow, what a resource they had at their disposal yeah. when, when writing that. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, too, like being a part of, you know, even by a lot of horror authors and horror filmmakers um this film is still one of the like more highly regarded um especially when it comes to like supernatural hauntings so to be a part of something so iconic and then so many years later looking back at it i imagine has to be a really cool and sort of surreal experience yeah it really stood the test of time this film has something of a hitchcock feel reminiscent of psycho released three years prior but with notes of citizen kane in point of fact I thought of this before discovering that Robert Wise was the editor of Citizen Kane, yet it also carries a uh, film noir-ish kind of style with its sharp dramatic lighting and camera angles, while other times playing more like a stage production. Definitely. It has like a sweeping, alive sort of energy to the camera work and cinematography that embodies the feeling of the house being alive. Yet it kind of puts you into that mindset of wondering what is real and what is not with this, just the work of illusions and uh, representing this hungry and praying sort of haunted funhouse feel, yet one that is constantly making you wonder if it's a trick of the eye, something off kilter in the architecture, or just the character's own minds slowly losing grips. Yeah, it, it functions in stark contrast to more modern films. It relies on suggestion. There are almost no special effects outside of perhaps a door closing or flexing a bit. Much is left to the imagination. It's more atmospheric rather than hitting one over the head with visual effects. In fact, not a single ghost is ever seen in this film, but are only heard. Yet, I find it far more effective than its 1999 counterpart. We also never see a single drop of blood. Yeah, I think it's it's the the subtlety really has power and it really develops a big part is is just this character study in, in these characters especially for Eleanor who is just so desperate and kind of off kilter and struggling with just this desperation of uh, her loneliness and finding somewhere where she needs to matter and needs to belong where she's so willingly to go under this house's spell, so to speak, and just the, the slow escalation of little little things seeming off or eerie. And there's, um, you know, a little bit of an exploration of this could be an alive presence and that doesn't necessarily mean it will harm you. Um, so it's just kind of like as they go into this more and the house, you know, slowly becomes more alive and, and hunts them more and more. But yeah, it's um, the the subtlety really does add a lot, which is probably the biggest flaw of the '99 film, which we'll go into later. But um, I think it's more about it, it. It is about the haunting and this evil presence, which I did really like that it um, quote a house that was born bad. Uh, I liked that it it focused on as with the original source material that it uh, held on to that sort of fascinating outlook of the house itself being a place of evil. I like that it was something that was just born of darkness rather than 
there, you know, are tortured spirits there that need to be set free. But the house itself is just darkness itself and is a constant. And that's something more grand that you can't really conquer or endure because it's something that just is evil. Yeah, it feels real. It feels grounded. So you believe it, allowing yourself to be more immersed in it. Otherwise, you're just being clobbered with a bunch of silly graphics that don't really mean a whole lot. Just hearing, for example, a banging on the door and seeing a doorknob slowly turning is so much more terrifying than actually showing what's behind that door. Hearing the question, uh, what is that or, or whose hand was I holding is far more terrifying to me than actually showing any sort of computer generated monster, regardless of how well it's done. Less is more, especially in this mm -hmm. genre. In fact, these are the most chilling moments in the film for me. And I think that if one of us was to experience something like this, I think that is more closer to what you would be seeing or experiencing, most likely. Just those little things that seem off or that creak in the door or pounding or, you know, the realizing that you think you're holding your friend's hand and it's just this chilling aura coming over you. You don't always see it. And I do think that makes it um, a little more true to life and realistic. And the overall suspense and haunting and the sort of dwindling mindset into madness uh, is able to take more more of a, a power like it feels it feels more realistic and kind of puts you into sort of the psychological aspect of a haunting and i like how they don't hit you over the head with things like um eleanor having a crush on the doctor they let you fill in the blanks and put the pieces together and, and feel a sense of pride even in figuring out what's really going on despite what's on the surface uh, it makes you look deeper and is more interactive and interesting as an audience experience. And I like how Theo's lesbian aspect is more unspoken, not because I find that offensive, actually quite the opposite, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, but it's not preaching or trying to force some messaging at us. It's just there and we pick up on it and there's sexual tension and it's uh, all just so much more interesting when presented that way. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you don't have to make a big deal. You can have that representation and have a character who has this sexuality without there, – there is a certain amount of sexual tension that, that really works, but it doesn't – they don't make it her whole identity or, like, a big deal because, no, it shouldn't be. This is a person, you know? Every once in a while, someone will say a line with such a, a sting on it, and they'll punctuate it with, with music, but it sends a shiver through my spine. I'll just go, wow. It just like cuts me to the mm -hmm. bone. And it happened like four or five times in the film. The delivery of poignant dialogue is way more powerful than any CGI ghost and doesn't cost anything to produce, though is perhaps more difficult to achieve in a, in a writing sense. This may not sound as sexy as an explosion or some sort of gore fest, but in fact, it really is much more effective, chilling, and fascinating. In our previous podcast about the novel, I described how strange and foreign it was for me to read a character's thoughts, which is not something done in screenplays uh, without the use of voiceover. But uh, weirdly enough, in this film, we actually have Eleanor's thoughts being expressed in that way, presumably a uh, carryover from the novel. But voiceover is often considered a lazy form of screenwriting. It's better to show than to tell, but it seems to work well enough here. I, I think you kind of need it a little bit to get, especially uh, Eleanor's mindset. There's, there's certainly ways and different avenues you could take to show what she went through and where she's at. And especially as, you know, her hold on this house and that desperation. But I do think the the voiceover is fairly essential here to uh, getting us to understand what she's going through. As in the novel, we are witness to the entrancing spell Nell is immediately put under. Even if she experiences that dash of fear and realization that it might be smarter to run from this dark dwelling upon her last chance. As once it has her claws in her, it might be futile. And just as in the book, I like that there was that one moment where she realizes, I want this, but this might not be the smartest thing. This is my last chance to kind of run away and get out of there. And 
just as quickly as that thought comes, it leaves. So that was a nice kind of lining up to uh, the source material. But ultimately, her loneliness and need to find a place where she might belong wins out and furthermore offers the house a satisfying subject to hunt. Much of the film is Nell's unraveling madness, her heightened desperation, and this tauntingly cruel dance with death she embarks on. As with the novel, there is a futile hope where there is a certain erratic sort of desperate nature to know, but I think for most people, I, I guess it kind of depends on the viewer. I could see some people where she might come across as whiny or naggy and they might not invest in her as a character, but I think overall you uh, you feel for her, and even if you know it's doomed, you have a certain amount of hope that if the rest of the world kind of has rejected her, she's never found her place or acceptance, maybe this macabre sinister little house could be where she finds her happiness even in death and um the one thing i i felt the book handled a little better with just her character and mindset was a uh something that is hard to convey in film um but kind of that ethereal daydreamer fantastical childlike quality that she had where she was constantly escaping and imagining something far more accepting and majestic than what life has left her with there are sprinkles of this, but I think the level of fantastical desperation and sorrow in her isn't shown in its full depth. Again, pretty small thing because they do illustrate how she is a little off kilter. She's not, she's definitely been lonely and lost and she really doesn't have anything. She, you know, says nothing's really happened to me. So almost even something horrible happening to her would be this exciting adventure that she's waited for her whole life. So there are, uh, there certainly are elements of it and overall the character exploration and just what they explore in her mental state and how it degrades more and more as it goes on is really strong. I just kind of felt, again, in the book, as happens a lot, they're, they are able to go into just that little extra depth that kind of showcases it a little more. There are moments where she does get a little too emotional and I feel a sense of wanting to slap her or just shake her and make her snap out of it in some way. It triggers me a little bit, but it's not to the point where I started hating her character or turned on her, but there were a couple of cut scenes, one where on her way to the house, she stops at like a restaurant or a gas station that they shot, but they didn't use in the film where it explored more of her her other uh, desires or other facets. I'm not quite sure. This was not something that I watched, but it was explained in a, in a YouTube video. But I really get that there's an economy in filmmaking where you have to just be ruthless and slash mm -hmm. and burn and, and not include everything. But it is a shame that they left that scene out. But I, I do understand because that was also, again, it was a small thing. You still get the for foreboding atmosphere. You get that horrible things have haunted, happened at Hill House. Um, but I think that was, um, it sounds like it might have touched on something similar to that um, when she stops, I think it was at a diner in the book and everyone is just immediately like, there's nothing here for you. Why would you ever come here? Stay away from Hill House. And even just in their own life, even people who live in this adjacent town just seem so solemn and miserable. Um, so I think that, that kind of added a little bit of a a dreariness and also just cut like Shirley Jackson's depiction of like the human experience, which is she doesn't necessarily view in the most positive light, mm -hmm. you know, just very lonely. And in the end, no one will really be there for you. And just kind of this like dreary ongoing um, existence. So I think um, in the book that did set up a little bit more of the the tension and ominous atmosphere and okay, what if people who haven't lived here but still have heard the stories are so wary of it, you know, it just kind of builds up more like what are we going to be getting into? I think that's the key. It, it would have built up this foreboding about what we're going to happen and painted a picture that even before we see the house that we knew it was going to be something definitely worth being worried about. Mm -hmm. But nothing really supernatural happens until 40 minutes into the film and yet we're still engaged because mm -hmm. of the characters, the setting, uh, and the story are so good in the building of mystery and tension. This film, I think, was about the same length as the 1999 version. But as we'll get into in our next podcast, these couldn't be more different films. 
And I can't wait to really tear into that one because <laughs> I think in a way, the messiness of the 1999 version, it doesn't ruin the 63 version. It only makes it better. It emphasizes how well they did that job with so fewer resources mm -hmm. and the limitations they had technologically and whatnot worked in their favor for sure. Yeah, I think it definitely, again, subtlety and it had, while it was this supernatural haunting and this this overall force of this house, it put a lot of emphasis on the psychological and the human experience that I think makes it so compelling for that hour plus where you might just hear little bumps in the night, little things happen, but it's it's more that kind of really looking into this mindset and this loneliness and where it can kind of lead you to. So it was, it's more focused on the character and bigger story rather than jump scares and the CGI effects coming out at you. Um, so yeah, the, the subtlety really adds a lot. And I think it has a little bit more of a poetic, meaningful spirit. The scope of this film feels more intimate than the epic scale of the 1999 version, almost stage play-like. But I think that lends itself better to this subject matter being more claustrophobic. Yeah, it definitely feels claustrophobic, like the entrapment of this house. And there is this sort of gothic beauty to it, but it's also something that really digs its its claws into as well. But it, yeah, I definitely agree there's things I like about the grandeur of the 1999 version, um, but this one, it feels a little bit more true to life because it's not so above and beyond scale. And it's more true to the book in that we have rooms with no windows. There's a sense of you could get lost in this environment. Instead of forming powerful moments through interesting characters and creative elements. Today, the idea is to show the most over-the-top effect possible, make it bigger than big, case in point, the recent Star Wars sequels or recent Star Trek. So here, like I mentioned before, just having a, a squeaky doorknob turning mm -hmm. is just weirdly so much more effective than the entire house collapsing in on itself. The pure production cost of one compared to the other, you would think that somebody would go, aha, we should probably focus more on these little story beats that actually are chilling rather than dealing with making this horror film into a Star Wars film or something that doesn't really fit what actually scares people. Yeah. And I think those the, those little moments, um, that's really just successfully building up tension and mystery. And I think that it kind of like digs more into kind of the basis of, of almost fear itself, you know, that it's not, it's almost the anticipating and the unknown and knowing something horrible could be around waiting in the shadows and the darkness versus, oh, something's attacking me in my face. Sure, in the moment, that would probably be scary as well. But there is something more about the craft of building up that mystery and tension and, um, Actually, a little bit of a departure, but I really liked the the first paranormal activity that I think it did that really well. I think it also helped. I saw it at one of the early, super early screens when you had to like demand this and you're, you're at your theater. Um, so there wasn't a lot of hype or expectations built up around it. But um, I thought the first one did that very well. It was fairly low budget. Um, it was more minimal and, but it built up that tension and that like just every moment, it was so much of that anxiety of like something's going to happen any minute, any minute. And you would see that little moving of blankets or the door creak or whatever it might be. And I just remember I was in a theater full of people who would all immediately freak out and even almost feeding off each other's energy uh, where I felt that tension and almost that fear more than I, I do in many other films. So there definitely is something to that where sometimes the suspense is more powerful than the reveal. There is a story I probably told this before, but I'm going to tell it again. There's something to be said for putting a cap on one's resources when you don't have a lot of budget or production value to work with, it forces you to be more creative. And in the case of, was it the same year? When did The Mummy with Brendan Fraser come out? 
That was like 98. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. Somewhere around there. Well, that one, uh, Stephen Summers had, I think it was $50 million or $40 million, And I really love that movie. It's one of my faves, uh, especially from that era. And the sequel, uh, they gave him double the budget, but it was half as good. And then he did Van Helsing, where they doubled that budget again. It's like $180 million or something like that. And it was like one-fourth as good as the previous one. So mm-hmm. it seems like in this case, where they had budget and technology restraints to make the 63 one, it really forced one to engage the audience's imagination instead of literally showing. And that's, I suppose, an example of where show, don't tell doesn't work. And I think Mm -hmm. in a horror, that could have the opposite effect where you don't want to show too much. You just want to suggest, suggest to don't tell. I don't know if there's a new phrase I can think (laughs) of that. But um, the 1999 version is they just threw everything at it. They had every resource at their disposal and it just did the exact opposite of what they were going for. It was not scary. Unless you're below the age of 10, that movie (laughs) was not scary. I have... um, a random point that occurred to me last night. I had a weird moment of clarity. It never really hit me before to this degree, but we've all seen plenty of movies in black and white and we're used to it. And I I love the feel of it, especially when applied to subject matter that fits it stylistically. But it struck me that we're watching something completely devoid of color, just black and white and shades of gray. If you really think about it, it's weird that we watch something with all the color taken out of it and it's still acceptable. The state doesn't happen in reality. And although filmmakers didn't have much choice in the beginning, uh, in the case of this film, for example, it was actually intentional. They could go either way. Yeah, I think uh, it definitely adds to the style and sort of that classic ghost story sort of feel. And it kind of also ties into one of the um, one of the sentiments from the book of almost Hill House being this kind of mixture of dream world and reality. It's like it sucked the life out of it. So there mm-hmm. shouldn't be any color in a movie like this. One interesting uh, note I found just been looking over sort of a little bit of the history and the making of the film is Julie Harris, who played Eleanor was actually suffering from depression while she was filming this. And she actively, throughout their time on set, actively isolated herself from the rest of the actors, which um, some of them felt that it was just like, oh, she's just antisocial, she doesn't like us. But it was, um, she has said it was really just her trying to stay effectively in that character of who felt so alone and isolated and losing her mind. And I think it definitely showed in her performance. But also that's something I've done to an extent as an actor, if you're just playing a character who is just alone and losing their mind, especially when you're losing your grips on sort of what's real and just your mind being totally preyed on. You know, a lot of, you know, even on filming, you know, material that's very dark and, you know, um, draining like that. It's usually a lot of fun working on film sets. So, uh, you know, like there have been times where I'm like, okay, I'm joking around, having too much fun with people. I need to stay in this like dark, depressing place. So I need to just pull myself away and stay in that place. So I just thought that was kind of like an interesting note, but probably even more so that some of that might have come from her real life experience if with uh, suffering from depression at the time of filming. That's one of those where... My inclination is to yet again reference The Shining and Shelley Duvall and her going through a similar experience. Uh, I saw, I don't know how old it was, but it was some footage of Shelley Duvall, how she looks now, or maybe it was like 10 years ago, but she looks like really different and she's apparently still struggling with issues, but... That's sad. That's like this element of suffering for your art and you, you create something that's so like beautiful and lasting. But there is also this line for actors, and of course, a lot of that wasn't her choice, but I also think of like Heath Ledger and the Joker. I feel like that was just an absolute masterpiece, but he isolated himself and really got into this dark place. And there were other factors, of course, like addiction, but 
there are these cases where you're like they committed so much to that character and that dark mindset that it seems like they couldn't really pull back and get their mental health back, which is horrible, of course. Yeah, I've been uh, wanting to take acting classes just so I can get in the mindset of an actor and figure out what they need from a director in getting direction. Like, how can I best communicate? And I think the best way to understand that is if I was an actor myself, which I'm not. It's one of those fields where somebody with no experience can just show up and just be charismatic enough and be able to communicate well enough to turn in a really good performance, which is a kind of a slap in the face to people who have really studied the craft for a long time. There's a lot of technical stuff you need to learn. It's, it's a little different on stage versus film, but it's not like drawing or something where you actually have to really, really, you could, you could literally just jump into it and be great at it. Mm -hmm. And I think, who's it? Mark Wahlberg refuses to take any acting lessons or yeah. do anything with a coach because he doesn't want to ruin like the spontaneity of it or something along those lines. So there are some certain actors that just have, there's so many different ways you can approach it. And, you know, just things like, how do you cry? Stuff like that. I, I'm still boggled over. I don't, I don't get how that's done while it's extremely easy for some people to just turn it on and turn it off like that. So I guess each has their strengths and yeah. each has their own uh, insecurities. Depends on the role for sure. Um, I think like kind of the darker, more emotional material. I mean, if you're someone who can just turn on those emotions, because a lot of it is pulling from real life experiences, which I guess it depends on what your real life experiences are and how quickly you can act on those. Um, but yeah, that is, that is interesting almost from the Wahlberg perspective there. I could see how an element uh, almost like the more practiced or rehearsed maybe becomes like less genuine because you are just expressing things true to the human experience. So I could, there's definitely something to honing your craft and really fine tuning those skills and how you can portray things genuinely, especially the heavier emotions, but I can almost see how, how there is something to just being natural and, and true to how you would react in that moment as it comes to you. This movie is called The Haunting, but the question remains, haunted by what? It's implied that the house is just evil, but beyond the structure itself, it seems to be infested by some sort of separate entity, since we hear a, a child scream, along with a deep male voice that may or may not be Hugh Crane's. There's also a scene where someone ghostly is holding Eleanor's hand in the dark. None of this is explained, but it's still intriguing. And this is what I realized. We have something called a MacGuffin, which Hitchcock popularized. This is something like an object or event in a story that serves merely as a trigger for the plot. It is necessary to the plot and the motivation of the characters, but it's actually rather insignificant, unimportant, or irrelevant in itself. For example, the the ring in The Lord of the Rings, the Ark of the Covenant in Raiders of the Lost Ark, or the plans for the Death Star in Star Wars. Here, the house itself and the reasons for it being haunted are not really the point and kind of don't matter. Instead, it's the reason for putting these characters there and moving their story forward. It's sort of a rare case where I normally always want to know, oh, what does this darkness look like? What is its origins? Like, I want the ins and outs of any monster usually. And I think it's because there it is this bigger, like evil itself, this bigger entity of this place, which was a theory that inspired a lot of other horror works that came after this. So I think it's just this looming and how it puts forward some of those questions of it could be this, it could be this. But yeah, it kind of really doesn't matter. It just this evil entity and force is there. And that ends up being more of how they explore this loneliness and desperation and human struggle and mental illness and how it kind of escalates to what ends up being a very tragic end true to the book. These are also very deep questions like what happens after death and so forth, which I my low expectations don't think that a Hollywood movie could really satisfy with an answer. It's best for people to fill in the blanks themselves or what is 
apprehensive about that may be different for each person. Some people it might be going to hell. Other people it might just be lingering in limbo as a ghost. Other people it could be just being lonely. Who knows? So it's kind of like you don't want to show things with special effects. You want to leave it to the imagination. Same thing here. Just just let it be and set the tone and the atmosphere and show that it is scary to these characters, live vicariously through them, and hope it comes off. If you would like to join our society of grotesquerie and loathing, please subscribe and give this podcast a like. Comment your wretched thoughts below along with what you would like us to expose in future episodes. Keep our podcast suffering on by finding it in your cold, black, withered hearts to support us on Patreon. A link to our PayPal is also below for one-time donations of any amount. It It was was nice nice knowing knowing you. you.